everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is Dustin Rudolph, PharmD. He is the author of The Empty Medicine Cabinet, The Pharmacist's Guide to the Hidden Dangers of Drugs, and the Healing Power of Food. With over a decade of experience in the field of pharmacy, Dustin Rudolph, PharmD, is a clinical pharmacist currently practicing in acute care community hospital setting. He graduated with a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in 2002 from North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. His professional experience covers a multitude of patient populations, including neonatal, pediatric, cardiac, orthopedic, oncology, diabetic, intensive care, and geriatric patients, to name just a few. In 2009, Dr. Rudolph adopted a vegetarian diet and then a whole food plant-based diet a year later. He founded his website at that time with a goal of providing reliable, high-quality, evidence-based health and wellness information to improve the knowledge of both patients and medical preference professionals alike. So please welcome Dustin Rudolph to the show. Hi, how are you? Thanks, AJ, for having me. This is great to be on. My pleasure. It's about time I got to you because I've had your book for such a, for some time now, and it's wonderful. What gave you the idea to write this book, if I may ask? Well, you, growing up and, and going through the conventional medical education system and then becoming a pharmacist, I had no idea about the powers of plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine. So once I found out about this, of course, I changed my own life and, and how I was eating and, and living myself, and that, that led to you know great improvements in energy and reduction in migraine headaches and, and so forth. But once I found out about this, I was like, I cannot just not share this. I have to get this out to people because I'm a healthcare professional, and you know professionals are the best at what they do, and my job is to care and to produce health. So that's my whole goal of going into become a healthcare professional was to help people do the best that they can to regain their health if it's possible. And so that's that's why I was like I had to get this book out. Wow. Well, how long were you a pharmacist before you found out about the benefits of a plant-based diet? I was a pharmacist for about seven and a half to eight years, right around in there. Right. What made you want to become one? That's, I, I, I think you're the first. Well, you're definitely the first pharmacist I've interviewed, and certainly the. the are, are you the only plant-based pharmacist out there? No, actually, the good news is, is I'm not the only one. There's one that's about an hour and a half, two hours south of me in Sarasota. I'm up in the Tampa Bay area. Her name is Evelise Capo, and she is the food pharmacist. So uh, there's two of us right here within a couple hours of each other. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what what made you decide to be a pharmacist, and then when did you find out about a plant-based diet? I actually wanted to become a pharmacist in fourth grade. So I know wow, it's I really yes, early. And I didn't even know a fourth grader would know what a pharmacist was. <laughs> most people, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think. And then most fourth graders make several different career changes by the time they get up through college. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to be a, a pharmacist in fourth grade, and the reason why – was because I come from a small town. It's called Baker, Montana. It's in the southeast corner of Montana. There's probably only about 16, 1,800 people in the whole town. And we had two pharmacies and two pharmacists in the whole town and one doctor. <laughs> and Todd Todd was our pharmacist. And he, he was so nice and friendly, and I always loved going to him uh, when my family would go in there. So I wanted to be like Todd. So I grew up, wow. and I wanted to be like Todd, and, and the rest is history. So you had more pharmacists than doctors. Yeah, we had more pharmacists. <laughs> isn't that isn't that uh, peculiar? That is that 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 is very very interesting. So when did you first find out about a plant based diet, and how long did it take you to adopt one once you found out about it? So I found out about this about like I said seven and a half to eight years into my pharmacy career, and it was kind of odd. I went to my podiatrist because I was having issues with some nerve pain in my foot. I work, I had worked in the retail pharmacy setting at that time, and uh, being on my feet all day, 12, 13, 14 hours a day, it, it took a toll on my feet. And so I went in to see my uh, podiatrist. I had no idea who he was in the first place. This is the first time I saw him. Went in there. It was right during the health care debate, before the health care law was passed. So I was reading a Time magazine article in his office, and I took it into the waiting room with me, and it had kind of pros and cons of both sides of the of the debate in there. He walks in the dirt. He walks in the room. His name is Dr. Sal. And 
Dr. Sal walks in the room and he goes, what you reading there, Dustin? And I go, oh, just an article on the healthcare debate. It's got, you know, great points on each side, and, you know, we kind of get to talking about this. And about a couple minutes into our conversation, he goes, well, you know, Dustin, it doesn't really matter what they legislate with this health care law. It's not going to fix our health care crisis. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's the whole point of the thing, you know. He goes, no, it's it's not going to fix our health care crisis. If we want to fix our health care crisis, we need a nation of healthy people. And mm. the light bulb just kind of went off right there, you know. Cool. And so he says, have I given you my reading list? And I, or he goes, I have a reading list. Um, and I go, what is it? You know, so he go, go, walks out of the room, comes back about 30 seconds later. He goes, to read these four books. If you can, I go, well, I'm a slow reader. I like to digest whatever I read. So if I only pick one of these books, which one should I pick? And he goes, the China study. Mm. Definitely in the China study. He goes, it should be mandatory reading for every medical student before they get out of med school. Yeah. So that's how I found out about it. Wow, that I think that book was really the turning point for a lot of people, you know? Absolutely. It's so evidence-based. Yeah, and, and, and people, uh, smarty pants that are clinicians like you seem to really, really like that one. I mean, I, I love it, too. It was a little bit over my head, but it's it's, a, it's an amazing book, and you know, I, I listened to it on TV. That was a little bit easier for me. But I'm so glad Dr. Campbell wrote that book, you know. Oh, I am too, because he saved my life and the lives of millions of other people. So, you know, you know you've know, probably heard this stuff in the old saying, you know, pay the grocer or pay the doctor, right? You've heard that saying, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah, yeah. You could almost say pay the pharmacist. Is it difficult now, now that you know what you know about nutrition and its efficacy for not only preventing these common diseases of lifestyle, but reversing it. Is, is your job sometimes hard? Sometimes not, not that you're a pill pusher, but you know that some of these medicines, I, I hate to say worthless, but they're kind of, you know, they don't really treat the underlying cause. They're just treating symptoms. So do you sometimes either get angry or frustrated knowing what you know that when you see these kind of pills you're dispensing for, for, for preventable diseases? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, when I first started learning about this, the first couple of years that I started learning about this, I was just almost livid because I was like, why didn't anybody teach us this stuff? This <laughs> no. is like the most important stuff you could possibly <laughs> learn being a clinician and a healthcare provider, and nobody said a word to it to me right. or to the rest of us. So, yeah, I was actually, I went through all those phases. I went through the, the you know, when you first hear about this, you're like in denial. It's like, I don't yeah. think guys, this person's crazy what they're talking about. And then and you kind of get to acceptance, and then you kind of get to a place where you just get really mad and angry about the whole situation and then I'm kind of long past that now I've gone through all that and now it's like how can I help people you well know? how how can you help people because like you're you're in a regular hospital setting right so you're like correct inpatient inpatient pharmacy right so you don't really have a lot of con do you have contact with patients I mean what what is your um like what do you do all day like uh, you know yeah. mm-hmm. Actually, I have, I have very little contact with patients, un- mm-hmm. unfortunately. In hospital pharmacy, it's different than retail pharmacy. In retail pharmacy, you get that face-to-face all the time. Yeah. In hospital pharmacy, you're kind of stuck in the dungeon in the room with, like, no windows. I know. <laughs> I used to, you know, I used to be a respiratory therapist, and when we'd have to go, you know, it's like the morgue and the pharmacy where both the things in the basement, and you're right, there's no windows. Yeah, it's it's kind of scary, you know, so you're kind of st- stuck in the basement in the corner and you kind of forgot about and in fact a lot of patients don't even know that hospitals have pharmacies wow. so um yeah so I, there's very little contact and then my my particular shift I do a seven on seven off shift so I actually work overnight but this way I have a set schedule so uh-huh. that every other week I can take my week off from being a pharmacist and I can be wow. a plant-based pharmacist Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So you is it, isn't that difficult though working at night? I mean, I've heard that 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 sometimes it's well, you know, you're 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 slender and stuff, but I've I've always thought that this kind of upsets your I don't know bio rhythms or whatever having to work at night. It's, it does. And the the first year that I worked there, it kind of it, it was great because I just stayed on a night schedule. But since my book came out last year, you know, you're always out speaking and and yeah. Doing, teleconferences and stuff like this so um then i've had to switch back and forth and it it does kind of take a toll on you on your sleeping pattern so it's yeah. just kind of 
part of the deal, you know. Oh, yeah, it just it just seems like I mean I remember when I was a respiratory therapist, I just like would always prayed when I was on call, please don't call me in at night. I just don't think I can stay up all night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad I eat my eat the way that I do, so that I have the energy that I have to get through it. Sure. So if you, the other thing is, if you're working at night, you, it sounds like you don't even have a lot of contact with coworkers, right? I mean, it's not like the hospital is at its busiest where you're hanging out in the cafeteria, or it seems like you you're kind of like almost solitary there. Yeah, it's. Uh, I work mostly with the doctors and the and the um, and the nurses. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes the respiratory therapists too actually yep. come down at night. But yeah, it's there's there's less staff, but you're you're kind of I stay busy because you know I kind of take care of two small hospitals. Sure. Uh, I'm just the only pharmacist for them. One I do remotely, so um, I do have some contact with the other healthcare professionals, um, and it is kind of nice to you know if it, with it not being as busy, you have time to say talk about other things. So a lot of them know that I've written a book and some information. So I kind of view that as my way to help spread the message mm-hmm. inside the, you know, on the inside. Now, do you ever, do they know you as like, I, I remember I've, I've interviewed quite a few, you know, plant-based doctors and a lot of them, at least the ones that are out here, you know, they, their colleagues call them the crazy vegan doctor. Are, do they call you the crazy vegan pharmacist or do they even maybe not even know? Um. No, they. I mean, most of them know kind of at least something that I've that I've written a book and it's on nutrition and health and you know it's about eating pure fruits and vegetables and stuff. But I don't really. Um, I don't. I kind of take the approach where I'm. I'm very soft in my approach. Wow. So, when, especially when I first meet people. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's the opposite of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of fire and a lot of energy, and that's yeah. great. You know, that's there's true. different approaches work for different people. It's, it's so funny because I just spoke at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend, and he paid me a compliment that said I was more like him. Not not that one is better, but, but you know, you are who you are, you know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in my written work, I'm probably a little bit more fiery. Mm-hmm. But um, in when I'm talking to people face-to-face, I, I really try to – I have a, just a softer tone and, and, and approach – and it seems to work well for me because um, that people realize that I'm, you know, just very caring and, and genuine about my message that I'm coming at them with, you know. So, no, I've never really been called the crazy one. Oh, thankfully. good. <laughs> did, did you notice any ch- – I mean, you, it sounded like, you know, when you first found out about the plant-based diet when you were at the podiatrist's office, that other than having some, you know, foot pain, you were pretty healthy. But did you notice any other changes when you went plant-based? Yeah, so I've had migraines since I've been 10 years old. And oh, boy. It runs, it runs in my family. A bunch of people in my family have mm-hmm. migraines. And I've had tension headaches since I've been in college. And so I would have headaches constantly, like probably half a dozen times a month. And now that's down to, you know, maybe once or twice a month wow. I have these. That's and great. I've, <clears throat> it is great. Um, I did have some issues with irritable bowel syndrome in college and a little bit after, but I don't have any problems with that anymore. And, of course, I've got more energy. I lost weight, not that I really needed to lose weight. I mean, no, we not met at each all. other last, yeah. last year in Tampa. So. Right. Um, but uh, other than that, I just I feel great. My numbers always come back excellent, and, um, you know, we can't ask for more. That is so cool. You know, when you think about it, wouldn't it be neat? You know, we've got, it's like if there was just like a, a plant-based hospital where, I mean, because, you know, even vegans, you know, I broke, I break bones all the time because I'm so accident prone, but could you imagine like the hospital of the future where the pharmacist is vegan and the diet, you know, where it, wouldn't that be kind of cool? That would be cool. And I guess if Kaiser Permanente keeps going down that road, maybe yeah. it will be someday. Oh, you know? that, that, that would be amazing. So t- t- talk a little bit about your blog and, and your book. Is it, is it available on Amazon or, or your website, The Empty Medicine Cabinet? I love the, the, the subtitle of it, The Pharmacist's Guide to the Hidden Dangers of Drugs and the Healing Powers of Food. I like that. Yeah, a little shock and awe there, huh? Yeah, and it's <laughs> the, the, the Hidden Dangers of Drugs is in red and the Healing Power of a food is in green. It's sort of like subliminal message right there, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted people to get out of it. So I'm so glad you noticed that. Yeah, I picked it, but, I picked um, it up right away. So uh, your your website is PursueHealthyU.com. Well, actually, I just switched it over. So okay. um, it's going to be PlantBasedPharmacist.com. 
Oh, that's great. And, okay, that makes sense. Pers- that, that's yeah, pursueahealthyu.com is going to is still my old blog, but I, I, I got a new website, plantbasedpharmacist.com, and um, you can go there and and the books on there. You can read all about. It. There's a little intro video for the book, and um, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and um, uh, Nook and iBooks and all yeah. kinds of everywhere you can find. Well, you have my story in there, so that's if there's no other reason, listeners, get it for that. But no, I'm just kidding. There's some great recipes. Exactly. And I'm so thankful that you provided that because that, yes. your your testimony is just, yes. your story is just amazing. And, yes. and thank, no. thank you for uh, asking me to share that. One of the things you say in the book is the more the more profound changes you make, the more profound results you see. That's so true. I, I noticed that with, with, well, with everything, you know. It is. And actually, I'm glad that you brought that up because just tonight I went to a picnic with an old coworker from mine from a previous hospital that I worked at, and he has um, he has GI issues. He has Crohn's disease, mm. and he said that since he's met me and read my book, that he's really cut out a lot of the meats, and he's probably like an 80-20 person now, where he does 80% plant based and 20% you know the animal and the processed foods. Mm-hmm. And he, he goes, just doing that, I can already notice the difference. That's you know, great. And, yeah. you know, so you don't have to be 100% and 100 and 100 and zero, you know. If you mm-hmm. do 80, 20, you're going to you're gonna get benefits too. But I always tell people if you have a chronic disease, yeah. that if you do the 100%, you're much more likely to get significant results mm-hmm. and not have to deal with little issues like that with things still popping up. Yeah. So how much of these medications that are prescribed do you think we could – get rid of if people, you know, ate healthily, you know, like I'm thinking of things like statins, things like that, you know. Oh, we could get rid of a lot of medications, Mm -hmm. which would be great. And then the market for me to teach people to eat fruits and vegetables. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) um, Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, antibiotics come in handy every once in a while when somebody gets sick or, you know, when you get Mm -hmm. a cut and it gets infected. Um, Pain medication comes in handy when you're in a car wreck. Sure. Uh, and, and anesthesia meds come in handy when you need to have surgery because you're in a car wreck. Yeah. But uh, other than that, you know, a lot of these a lot of these medications for lowering lipids and cholesterol and lowering your blood pressure and, you know, calming down your stomach and uh, for constipation and diarrhea and all, all these things, we really wouldn't need any of that yeah. if we just ate healthy. So we could significantly reduce our medications. And it seems like that if, if you know, it doesn't, it, it, because these medications, they didn't always exist, it seems like people don't even have the, it's like they don't even try some of them because now there's a pill for every ill. You know what I mean? Like if they didn't exist, people would have to do something about it. Yeah, it's almost like the, the prescription is is your permission, you know, your permission mm-hmm. slip to, to eat or continue eating the way that you're eating. Yeah. Yeah. That causes the disease. So, yeah, it does, does kind of create that. And then a lot of times they have to give one medication to offset a side effect from another medication, and it gets, gets crazy, doesn't it? All the time. And you know what? I've seen in, in the hospital, of course, we get the sickest of the sick in the hospital, and it's not uncommon for me to see people really what I would consider middle-aged, you know, in their 50s or mm-hmm. 60s, because um, we should all be able to live to in our 90s and 100, mm-hmm. eat well and, and stay well. So people that I would consider middle-aged, they're coming in and they're on 10, 15, 20 different medications. I mean, and how is that even possible? How do you swallow that many a day? And how do you remember to take them? That's crazy. I, and that's, a, that's the other issue is most people aren't compliant with their mm-hmm. medication regimen because once you get on so many pills and you're going to figure out, like, what times a day you got to take them and, you know, how many you take in the morning and which one's at night and all this stuff. A lot of people forget if they did or or maybe they're out and they don't have it with them and then they forget to take it when they get home. And so, yeah, it does create issues. And the one thing that I've noticed, AJ, is that the more medications that somebody is on, the more miserable and sick they are, hands I, down, every time. You know, that's that, that's, that, that sounds like it would be... Correct. I mean, I, when I think about it, I used to work at a retirement home and in a nursing home, and I think you're absolutely right. I, I, that that probably you could probably study that and, and and create a study to prove that hypothesis. You know. Absolutely, and it's and I say all the time that there is a time and a place for medication. So it's not like I'm against all medications and all medical conditions ever. But 
you know, to, you don't need six years of pharmacy to school to notice that if somebody goes from one medication to 20 medications, that they're more miserable and sick, that you put mm. two and two together, you know. Yeah. Did you, you know, it's funny because um, about, it was about five five or six years ago when I first met the Esselstyns, and Ann Esselstyn and uh, Rip and Dr. Esselstyn came for dinner because they were speaking somewhere. And the next day, Ann Esselstyn broke her hip. At the, at the lecture, she slipped on, there was a piece of fruit on the floor. And so the paramedics came. I don't remember how old she was at the time, but but, but they came and they said, how old are you? And she's, she was in her 70s, whatever. Let's just say 72. Are you on any medi- uh, do, Are you on a medication? No. Do you have any medical conditions? No. You know, but can you imagine most people wouldn't have answered those three questions that way, you know? Exactly. And, and I think that this is the first time I've ever heard of a fruit or a vegetable hurting somebody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> for real. <laughs> what a great sense of humor. That is so funny. That is... Hey, just just, uh, just out of curiosity, have you ever read a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker? No, I haven't. Okay, well, they, you probably won't be able to comment, but it's a book that's widely recommended in the plant-based community by people like Dr. McDougall and Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Doug Lyle, because he's spoken at, at a lot of the conferences, speaking at Dr. Popper's conference this year. It's a book, he's a, he's not a doctor, He, I believe he's a, either a reporter or an investigative journalist, but it's about the history of psychiatric drugs in America. And it's a very long book, and it's a very detailed book, but basically it, it makes a case for that not only are these drugs dangerous but they don't work and he mm-hmm. cites lots of different studies about how when Prozac was being tested they found that actually the placebo was more effective but they don't really let that stuff out so I'm just wondering uh, you know how do you have any thoughts about psychiatric medication or you just really aren't supposed to you're supposed to be impartial because that's not your job to comment no actually uh, I mean I'm my own pharmacist so I am the pill expert um, yeah uh, just yesterday, it's funny you talk about this. Just yesterday, I saw a little uh, medical news flash on a new study that was, I believe it was in the British Medical Journal. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> these investigators, they were independent and unbiased, so it wasn't the drug company, but they actually took a study that was done on Paxil or paroxetine. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes under a couple other different brand names for different indications, but it's paroxetine. And they looked at basically data on a study that they did paroxetine in adolescents and young people for depression, this this drug being used for that. And not only did they find that it was ineffective and that it didn't help anybody, but I believe during the study, 11 kids had suicidal thoughts and ideation. Mm. Um, and in the placebo group, one child did. So there was a significant increase oh. in risk of that. Yeah. So, like, you know, in, in especially in the youngers, I mean, even the FDA put a boxed warning on these antidepressants and antipsychotics that it can increase suicidal risk and ideation in especially the younger generations. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, it is kind of scary, you know, and um, it's probably my least favorite class of drugs. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the studies on on going to therapy and, mm-hmm. and counseling, and then also taking a de- antidepressant, mm-hmm. they basically are equally effective. Mm-hmm. But with the antidepressants, you have the risk of the adverse effects and the side effects. Whereas sure. nobody has side effects from going to counseling. Right. You know, right. Other than uh, inconvenience in your schedule. Right. That's interesting. What is the number one prescribed drug? I read on Medscape that it was thyroid medication. Is that still the case? That's a good question. And I'm not sure. I know. A few years back, I believe it was it was either a statin or a PPI or proton pump inhibitor, mm-hmm. so like Nexium and Prilosec and, and stuff, or mm-hmm. it was uh, like Lipitor or Zocor. Um, it very well could be a thyroid medication because many people are on thyroid medications, but I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest with you. You know, I don't go to the doctor very often, but it seems like every time I do, there's always somebody, often a woman, very attractively dressed. With a with like a suitcase roller, always dropping off samples of drugs or presents to the doctor. Do that? Does that happen to you at the hospital, or you just? It's not the same. It it does, and actually, early on in my career, I would you know they'd always bring lunch in all the time, you know, mm-hmm. and I would I would eat lunch. Well, for one thing, I I didn't know about the diet thing, mm-hmm. and then the other thing is 
doing my research for the book, I have a whole chapter in there on the lobbying efforts by the drug companies and the and the um, and the food industry in there, and how they also have a, the drug companies have a uh, program where they they pay doctors and pharmacists to go out and speak on behalf of their drugs, and they pay them speakers fees for this. So there, you can go to dollarsfordocs.com, uh, and it's a database on how much money the different doctors have been paid by drug companies. So, you know, to speak on their behalf. So it's, I've learned about the money and the and the special interest behind all this. And I just looked at myself and I'm like, okay, my, this is when my grandmother was still alive on my um, father's side. My grandmother has a difficult time paying for her medications. And she, they've had to switch her around to different like generics that they can get for really cheap because she can't actually afford her medications. And here I am, you know, having a smorgasbord of lunch once or twice a week from all these drug companies. And I know that cuts into the, that that's an expense that they have, that they have to raise their rates on their drugs. So it's, I can't be a hypocrite here and, and eat this food from the drug company mm-hmm. and then have my own grandma can't afford her medications that she needs. Mm-hmm. So you know, at that point, and I wasn't even as far along as I am now, but at that point I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Even if they bring lunch in and it's salad and it's perfectly healthy, I'm still not going to eat the salad because it comes from them. So i got to take a stand for this. Good for you. Good for you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, so I always wondered, you know, when you, cause I don't, like I say, I don't really take medicine, but you know, a lot of times I've, I've had a lot of dogs and as they get older, they, they get medicine when you're, you're not supposed to throw medicine away, right? Because you're not supposed to, how do you dispose of it? You're not supposed to flush it in the toilet. They say you're really not supposed to put it in the trash. So what do you do with pills when you don't need them anymore? That, yeah, that's been a big problem and it's just starting to get addressed now uh, more recently. Um, some pills are okay to, to flush. I mean, the things that you can flush are like electrolytes. So sometimes people are on potassium pills mm-hmm. or maybe magnesium pills, and like we we are we are able to even with the environmental aspect of it to flush potassium and and some of the electrolytes down the drain uh, because those are minerals and, and and vitamins in our in our soil anyway, you know. But like the the other drugs, most of the all the other drugs are an actual chemical that's not natural. So mm-hmm. you, you're you not supposed to dispose of them like that. Just throw them, you're not supposed to throw them in the trash or flush them down the toilet. So what they've done, at least in the Tampa Bay area, is many of the sheriff's department offices are now holding like once or twice monthly bring back events. Mm-hmm. And you can actually bring in all your old prescriptions or if there was a death in the family, you can gather up all those prescriptions bring them into the sheriff's office, and they'll take them all. Um, Pharmacies aren't supposed to take drugs back as well, especially controlled substances like Mm -hmm. morphine and and Percocet and that kind of stuff because Mm -hmm. those are very controlled by the DEA, and and pharmacies are not supposed to take those back. So unless they have a special certificate with the DEA. Mm -hmm. But most pharmacies don't go to the trouble to do that. So really, I would contact your local sheriff's department or police department and just ask them, what do we do with all these meds? Because yeah. around here, they're taking them back. I see. Okay. And what do they do with them? Just uh, give it to the people in jail? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know if they send it off to a uh, special manufacturer to like incinerate them or or what they do with them, to be honest with you. I've, I haven't had the chance to actually... Yeah. be at the sheriff's department to ask. Yeah. Why are medications so expensive? You know, until the and then the, the, like what's a patent? Like 17 years or something and then when it comes off patent then it's generic and what, I mean, do you think generics work as well and 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 why why is it so expensive for most medications? Well, it's expensive because bottom line is the drug companies want to make lots of money to make their shareholders mm-hmm. happy to mm-hmm. have good returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that That's makes- why it's expensive. So generics work just as well as the brand name drugs. There's only a couple of medications that uh, I would really recommend that if you're on the brand name, you stay on the brand name, or if you're on the generic for that particular drug, you stay on the generic because they're drugs that are narrow therapeutic 
drug, so they have a narrow therapeutic, therapeutic index. That means mm-hmm. they have a very small window of where their level needs to be in the in the body, mm-hmm. in the blood, to to work, but not too little, so they don't work, but not too much to cause side effects and toxic mm-hmm. effects. Are and you one able, of those? Oh, great! I was going to say if you could share what those are with us. Yeah. So uh, the common ones right off the top of my head that I can think of are phenytoin, which is a seizure drug. Mm-hmm. Carbamazepine, which is a seizure, seizure drug, uh, digoxin, which is for the heart, uh, hypo like the uh, levothyroxine and and the thyroid pills. Mm-hmm. All of those are neurotherapeutic drugs. Uh, wait, so wait, 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 stop for a minute, because that's what I'm okay. on. So, so I, 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 they give me generic instead of Levo. Should I fight to be on the Levo? No, no, it's not that you should fight to be on the brand name. It's that if if you're on the generic. I mm-hmm. would recommend staying on the generic with I that, see. I that see particular manufacturer. I got because it. Because different manufacturers might be a little bit different. And since yeah. the window is so small that you need to be on, you should stick with the one company. I see. Yeah, because they sometimes they just seem to do what they want. And, they, and I'm like, why does this look different? Oh, we changed it. That's, I'm, I, it's interesting. And then Warfarin is another one. A lot of people are on Warfarin or Coumadin mm-hmm. is the brand name. Hmm. So, were you a pharmacist in in the '90s when Fen-Fen was all the rage, or were you still in school then? I was actually still in high school, and in the late '90s, I was in my first years of college. Right. So, do you do but, you remember uh, that drug, or it was actually two drugs, fentramine and fenfluramine, that when combined, it was like the holy grail of of weight loss drugs? Yeah, I do kind of remember that until people started keeling over with like heart problems and right, exactly. And so, yeah. so it, that's that's. Uh, have you seen anything lately since then where where a drug has been touted as just like this great thing, and then all of a sudden it's not so great? Well, there was uh, Vioxx, which was maybe in the early two thousands. Right, that, that was exactly. arthritis or something, and it was causing bleeding or something, if I remember. Right, it was. Well, it was an anti-inflammatory, yeah, an, an, an NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and mm-hmm. it was really used for like arthritis and other inflammatory uh, problems. But it was supposed to have less GI bleeding, but what it ended up doing was causing um, heart failure and, wow. and heart heart death. So that's one of them. Another one is Avandia. Mm-hmm. Avandia is a diabetes medication, and so it's supposed to help you know, control blood sugar levels, but it ended up causing <clears throat> peripheral edema and, and fluid retention, and therefore that put a load on the heart and caused heart failure and cardiac events with that. Mm. It just seems like so many people are on sleep medicines now that, it, I, you know, since as I get older, it just seems more and more people are taking these drugs. Yeah, sleep medication is becoming uh, more highly used you're you're right and those drugs uh they kind of have the tendency to have the same some of the same side effects as the antipsychotics and antidepressants is some of them can actually make depression worse and cause suicidal thoughts in some mm-hmm. people and then um like ambien is actually a drug that I'd be very careful with especially in the higher dose of 10 milligrams because it can make people sleepwalk and I've heard and, that. Yeah, some people have even sleep drove. Oh my! Um, can you imagine sleep driving? <gasps> oh boy, that's crazy. So you do got to be careful. And, and and you know, one of my close relatives was ended up in the, in the hospital, and they gave him Ambien, and ended up on the floor, waking up in the middle of the night on the floor, not knowing how they got there. Well, so I, that's it's so afraid. I am so afraid of medication. Honestly, it's like it just to me, it's just scary. Yeah, and, and to think about like sleep, if you if you eat well and you exercise, exercise is really important to have a good yes. night's sleep. Um, if you do those things, then usually your sleep can fall into place. Mm-hmm. Um, there, you know, if you if you need a sleep medication, what I always usually recommend first is more something like melatonin. Mm-hmm. It's over the counter. There's not nearly as drastic of side effects. So yeah. So if you're working the night shift, do you sleep when you get home or do you wake up and go to work? Yeah, I, I sleep during the day. You sleep, yep, during, I sleep the day. during the day. And then and so when do you have, when do you exercise then? So I don't get much exercise in during my work week because 
I, I basically I'm working and commuting for like between 85 and 90 hours that week. Sheesh. So I, there's not much time left for sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, on my off week, I my form of exercise that I like the best is walking. I've mm-hmm. never really been a gym person, but I really like walking and a little bit of jogging. And then I'm very faithful at doing my core exercises and uh, push-ups. Good. To, I want to strengthen my core because I, I sit at work a lot, so got to have strong muscles in the abdomen and the back. Mm, very cool. So do you see – well, because you're in a hospital, you probably don't see it, but what about Viagra? I, I see those commercials, and they crack me up because the side effects now, when you watch these commercials, it's like why would anybody even take these drugs, you know, when they list all these possible side effects? If you have an erection that lasts longer than four hours, you know, things like that. Yeah, and and it's it's one of those things that Viagra is a basically it it does kind of dilate the vessels so uh, you, you get more blood flow, mm-hmm. but it does have some. It's not common, but sometimes it can cause priapism, which is uh, an eruption for more than four hours. That we have had people that have had to come to the ER for that, and then you actually actually have to do an epinephrine injection right into the into the penis to Ooh, get it to yeah. subside, so that's not Wait. a very pleasant thing. Yeah, that but, doesn't um, sound like it'd be fun. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, like uh, erectile dysfunction is a dietary disease, so you could just yes. you could eat your fruits and vegetables and have it go away, and then not have to pay the high cost of the Viagra. Of course. Not have any side effects. Of course, that's that absolutely. I remember interviewing Dr. Terry Mason, the urologist that was in Forks Over Knives on the show, and he one of the first things he said is, you know, the stiffer the arteries, the softer the penis. That by the time a man presents to his urologist with uh, with impotence, he's already got advanced heart disease. He says, if you have vascular disease anywhere, you have vascular disease everywhere. Yeah, ED actually shows up about approximately two to three years before any heart major heart effects start showing up. Yeah, that's good. So it so, is, yeah, so it's a red flag. You wrote this really great blog post, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit more in detail about it. Three questions to always ask your pharmacist. So um, I don't really ask my pharmacist very much. He's very nice, but I think he likes paleo, so we don't really talk very much. But uh, uh, what, what, what are the three questions we should always ask our pharmacist? So one of the most important questions that I try to get people to ask their doctor about or their pharmacist is that, you know, it deals with how are the statistics reported in the medical literature because it can be very deceptive. And so we're talking about the difference between absolute risk reduction and uh, relative risk reduction. And to kind of explain this in a nutshell, let's say, um, Dustin is, has drug X, and it's a new drug, and it's and it's crazy good for heart disease. And I'm going to come out with this drug, and I have to do a study to prove that it's good for heart disease and to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And so I round up 200 people, and I put, I split them up into two groups, and each group has 100 people in it. And I'm going to take my drug X, and I'm going to give drug X to one uh, one side of the group, so 100 people, and on the other 100 people, I'm going to give a placebo. So placebo has nothing in it. And then I'm going to follow them for a certain number of years, maybe five years or whatever it is, and I'm going to see who had heart attacks in the drug X group and who had heart attacks in the placebo group. And after five years, let's say that in the drug X group, two people had a heart attack. And in the placebo group, four people had a heart attack. So how the numbers usually get reported, especially if you're watching TV, is this a really good way to market drugs is to use relative risk reduction. So relative risk reduction in this particular scenario would be a 50% reduction in heart attacks because two is half of four, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 50% reduction in a heart attack. The problem is, is that there was more than six people in the study, right? There's 200 people in the study. Mm-hmm. So we can't just ignore 194 of them. So, what about the absolute risk reduction is taking all 200 people into account. And the absolute risk reduction for this particular case is 2% reduction in heart attack. That's a big difference. So you, because there was 2 out of 100, so 2% had heart attacks in the drug X group, and 4 out of 100, 4% had 
heart attacks in the placebo group. So if you take 4% minus 2%, that's 2%. So the absolute risk reduction was 2%. The relative risk reduction was 50%. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge difference. And, and, and a lot of people don't realize that relative risk reduction numbers are the ones that are really reported, mm-hmm. especially on TV and in marketing. So yeah. that's something that I would ask, what is the absolute risk reduction in whatever you're being treated for? You're trying yeah. to prevent heart attacks or, or strokes or, or whatever, you know, limb amputations and diabetes or whatever you're trying to be treated for. Yeah, that that makes sense. And I bet you a lot of people aren't even aware of what you just sp- spoke about and they just look at those numbers. It's like, oh, wow, you know, 50% reduction when it's not really truly 50%. Yeah, because if I'm the patient and, and I'm told, oh, you have 50% chance that you're gonna, this is going to work and you're not going to have a heart attack, mm-hmm. or if somebody says, well, you have a 2% chance, you know, that's going to weigh into my decision. Mm-hmm. So yes. then another question that I would always ask is, what are the possible risks and side effects and adverse effects from, from doing this treatment or this drug or this surgery or whatever it is? You know, how many you can do the same thing. It's called um, numbers needed to harm. So how many people need to be treated for one person to be harmed? Uh, uh, and you can find out, you know, how many people get dizziness or how many people get, you know, uh, maybe they develop diabetes from taking the drug, you know, for the prevention of heart attacks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how many people get this out of that? And that's usually always reported as, of course, the relative reduction in in harmful effects because you want a low number there if you're a drug company, right? Mm-hmm. So those are usually reported correctly. Um, now, and then the question three is, wh- what happens if I choose to do nothing? Because sometimes doing nothing is better than doing something. In sure. Medicine. You know, so as an example is that when you have, uh, there are drugs out there called androgen deprivation therapy drugs, and they're used for prostate cancer. And they basically reduce the amount of testosterone in the body, and the lower the testosterone, the lower the risk of, of, of prostate cancer for men. So if you use these drugs in a particular case where it's localized, slow-growing prostate cancer, so it's just in the prostate, hasn't went anywhere else, and it's slow-growing. When you use these drugs in that condition, in, in the real-world studies, that actually shows that more men die from prostate cancer who use the drugs than men who just decided to do nothing, and which is called watchful waiting. You know, mm-hmm. they're not them and just keep an eye on it. So, it, you know, sometimes doing nothing is better. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's very helpful. You know, all these medications that people are on and more and more seem to be invented or whatever the word is every day, do you really think they're helping people to live long, better lives or just longer lives? I would say... I guess we're living longer lives. We're certainly living longer lives if you look at the life expectancy as it's gone up over the last several hundred years. But um, I wouldn't say necessarily better, and I think I've even read in a in a study, I mean, don't quote me, but I think it was uh, the last, uh, what was it, 10 or 20 years of our life is, isn't good quality mm-hmm. years of life. It's it's being sick and being suffering from one chronic disease or another. So right. we're living longer, but we're not necessarily living better at the end of our years. Yeah, that's that's. I would I would agree with that. At least the people in my family, I saw them all die of these lifestyle related diseases. You know, when you get your prescription from the pharmacy, wherever you get it, you know, it always comes with the, that that piece of paper and. You know, uh, my doctor told me a long time ago, don't read it because he said you'll get every side effect. But I can't believe how many different side effects there are for what even could you could say is a benign drug. It's it's crazy. It is. And they and the drug manufacturers have to list every side effect that ever happened mm-hmm. to somebody in their trials, even if it was maybe directly due to the drug and could be proven or just was a coincidence that it happened. So the list is very, very long. And, you know, most of those are, it would be uncommon to get a lot of those on that list of most drugs. But there are some that are more proven than others, and those are the ones that you you really want to ask about. Um, I would, you know, I would, if I'm going to take a medication, I would 
want to ask my doctor or pharmacist, uh, what are the common side effects of this drug? And then what are the rare but serious side effects of this drug? Because mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. if, if, you, if something increases your risk of stroke, but maybe it helps you control your diabetes longer, then if it's a you know, 0.1% chance of having a stroke, but it can help you with your diabetes longer, you have to take that into account and what's worth it. And ultimately, you're the patient. So you're in charge, and it's your body, and it's your life, and you only got one life to live and one, one body to live it in. So you really need to make the decision and take the responsibility on yourself and get educated and make informed decisions. Isn't it true, though, we don't hear about this a lot, but people can die from taking medications, like, if, you know, if they were either allergic or, I mean, doesn't that happen sometimes? Yeah, it's uh, like the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Is right. the I, use but of the thing is, is how, if you have never taken a medication, how do you know that it's going to kill you or that you're allergic? That's why it seems so scary to me. And people just seem to be so trusting. Their doctor writes them, a, you know, on a piece of paper, and people just like fill it. I, I've always been a doubting Thomas, you know. And it, I mean, it took me years to even go on this thyroid medication because I'm just, I'm like almost like Fox Mulder in the X Files, trust no one kind of thing. But how does somebody know? <laughs> If they're going to have a side effect, especially a fatal one, to a medication if they've never taken it. You don't. It's it's basically like roulette. Roulette. You know. I mean. Yeah. I, I no. There's not a single human being on the planet, doctor, or pharmacist, or otherwise, that can tell you whether you're going to be in that percentage of patients that's going to be helped by taking this medication, mm-hmm. or you're going to be in the percentage of patients that's going to be harmed by taking this medication with one of the adverse effects or whether you're going to be helped and then harmed at the same time. There's yeah. just no way to tell. Yeah, interesting. I'm one of the few people, I, maybe I'm not the, one of the few people, but I'm the only one I know. I'm actually allergic to aspirin, and that means I'm allergic to lots of other drugs too. And because of having that from a young you know, age on, I just, I just didn't trust medicines at all because after having an allergic reaction to like what is like one of the most common things that you can get at the 99 cent store, I'm thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't be taking any pills. Is, is that, are, are certain medications more common for people to be allergic to than others in, in your experience? Yeah, there are, there, there are, of course, there's the antibiotics. Uh, you know, penicillin comes to mind and mm-hmm. sulfa, sulfa antibiotics. I'm allergic um, to that too. I'm are really, you? Yeah. yeah. I really am, yeah. Interesting. A lot of people are, and, and uh, those are the two antibiotics that I can think of. And then, you know, there, there are people that are allergic to NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories like aspirin. And Me that's too. kind of all in the same group. Yeah. Me too. So, yeah, that, that happens. Uh, I, wish, I wish I could tell every patient that, yes, you'll be allergic or no, you won't before you take it, but you don't really know. It's kind of like rolling, rolling the dice. Well, what about like, you know, like I said, most of my life before I became a chef 15 years ago, I spent as like an activity director retirement home and I still occasionally volunteer. And these people are on so many medications often prescribed by from different doctors. So like the orthopedic doctor prescribes that, you know, like in, in it's almost like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing is I know you're not in, in a, in a, you're in a hospital now, so you don't see those kind of patients, but is it sort of your job to kind of look at how all these things interact in the body and maybe say, Hey, you know, you really shouldn't be on this if you're on this. Is, is that sort of what your area of expertise is at times? Yes. Actually, this happens more often than you think. Um, just last week when I was working in the hospital, I had a patient come in, and <clears throat> they were on two different beta blockers. Mm. So they were they, they basically the, the physician, the admitting physician, had continued the home medications while in the hospital. And on the medication history, um, the the nurses had put that they were on atenolol and metoprolol. So these are both beta blockers, and you shouldn't be giving both of these at the same time. They they do the same exact thing. Um, so I, I called and I said, this doesn't make any sense. Why? What's going on here? You know, is this maybe old records from a previous admission, and then you added one of the new beta blockers now on this admission, and you just forgot to take the old one off, or what's going on? And um, they said, no, no, the patient says that they take both of them. I go, no, this isn't right. Do not, this, nobody ever takes both of these at the same time. It's not right. I go, can you ask the patient, is it from, um, did the same doctor prescribe both medications? So, you know, they put me on hold, they came back, and they said, no, they said one doctor prescribed one of them and another doctor prescribed a different one. And I go, well, 
that's right there. I go, they, they probably, the left hand's not talking to the right hand, and we got to get this situated because nobody should ever be on both of these at the same time. So well, that's that happened fairly common. That's good that you, you know, that you were able to, to, to figure that out. So good for you. So how many, how many errors do you, I mean, I, I'm sure you don't, but like, do, how many errors actually could occur from at your end? I remember when I was in my 20s, I have asthma, and I was, or they ordered a respiratory medicine for me, and the pharmacist made a mistake and gave me a heart medicine. And because I was a respiratory therapist, I knew it was the wrong drug. But if I was a layperson, I could have taken that and gotten, you know, very sick. Yeah, exactly, and thank thank goodness you were a respiratory therapist yeah. and knew the difference. Because I, um, I knew I knew I knew it just wasn't the right drug. But but like, in how often do you think errors occur um, at the pharmacy end? I would say that happens. Uh, a lot less commonly in the dispensing area, mm -hmm. uh, in the dispensing aspect of it, because um, maybe maybe something is dispensed wrong once a month in a pharmacy. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and of course, the busier pharmacies have more chance of an error, but because you have so many different checks and balances now, like when we, when in a hospital, when we send medication up to the floor to the patient, mm -hmm. um, First of all, one technician, at least one technician, sees it and, mm -hmm. and gets it, labels it. The technician actually, ha everything's barcoded. So the technician has to scan the barcode to, tell, to make sure the computer tells them that it's the right medication. So right there, that's one check, or that's actually two checks, because they should visually check it, and then the computer should check it. And then the pharmacist checks it, and they have to visually check it and then check it again with the computer. And then a technician, another technician might check it again when it's taken up to the upstairs, up on the floor, and put in the Pixis machine. And they have to scan it at the Pixis machine, and the computer has to make sure that it's right. So there's multiple checks. And then the nurse has to check it before they give it to the patient. So you have four different people who have seen this medication, and it's being scanned four different times by a computer system. So the amount of errors that happen now is far, far less in the dispensing aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, and technology is, is a big reason why it helps us because when you get so busy, you only have so much, you know, your eyes are going everywhere. So that has helped a lot. Um, that's reduced a lot. But um, I would say the errors that happen are probably more common of the example that I gave earlier when somebody comes in on two beta blockers. Sure. Two different doctors don't know what the other one's doing, and maybe they go to three or four different pharmacies, and they get different drugs at different pharmacies, so the one pharmacist can't see what the other pharmacist is using. Right. That's usually where stuff happens. Yeah. So is it really hard to read these, the doctor's handwriting, or is that a cliche? Or was there a course in pharmacy school where they taught you how to read doctor's handwriting? No, there isn't. I wish there was. <laughs> but it, it really there, is that bad, huh? There, there isn't. And now it's not so bad because it's all typed on a computer. So thank goodness we have that. Oh. But yeah, yeah, before you got really good at reading hieroglyphics. Let me tell you. Mm. That's funny. You know, I, I, it, is it? <laughs> this is like, I just got to ask this because my brain, this is how I think, but not so much for you. But, you know, you're working around all those medications. Is it, is it like, you know, is it like a kid in a candy store? Are you ever tempted to just, you know, take a few home <laughs> and try some of the fun ones? No, not, definitely not. No, okay. because I know, like, I know the pros and the cons. So I know the benefits and the risk. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm I'm healthy, so I I have no no desire whatsoever to be on right. I don't these medications. So so um, you mentioned that you do some speaking. Where, if people want to see you or hear you, how can they find out more about you and the work you do outside of the hospital, of course. Well, you can uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. It's a free newsletter online on my website at plantbasedpharmacist.com, and I'm actually just going to be sending out a, a little notice on my upcoming speaking events in the fall here. Uh, so you can do it that way, um, and or just stay tuned on my website. Great. Now, if you're working at night, when 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 is breakfast? I mean, do you? Because I would imagine the hospital cafeteria is closed during your shift, so and and they're not necessarily known for their healthy food. So, do you bring your lunch or dinner or whatever meal that's called with you? And I, I, do you cook a lot of your meals, Dustin? Or what? How is it? How does that work for I you? I do. I bring all my own meals, and I have for several years. Um, uh, eating this way, it, it is hard to find 
maybe not so much plant-based items because I work for an Adventist hospital, and they're probably one of the best hospitals uh-huh. to find plant-based care at. Didn't realize. That's great. Yeah, so they're very vegetarian friendly, and they have a lot of veg options. Um, but the cafeteria is closed at night, so I, I do bring all my food. Um, sometimes it's not the easiest to find stuff without oil in, in the yeah. cafeteria still. So okay. that that can be an issue. But, um, yeah, I bring all my food, and I don't have time to cook when I'm on my work week because it's just there's too many hours in commuting and working. So I, what I'll do is, like, maybe two or three days out of my off week, I'll just make big batches of food, and I'll – store it and I'll refrigerate it or freeze it and then I'll bring that for my off week or my on week. That That's makes how I do it. sense. You have some great re- recipes. You have 50 recipes in your book, The Empty Medicine Cabinet. You have some great recipes on your blog, especially the burger one. Oh, thank you. Yes, very much. I'm, I'm working away on trying to do more too. The recipe part isn't my forte. You know, I know you're wonderful yeah. at that. <laughs> thank um, you. But I, I really get nitty gritty on the evidence and the science and explaining mm-hmm. all these diseases. But I am going to try to work more on getting more recipes out there. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to eat? Uh, banana ice cream. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love sweet stuff. So, yeah, banana ice cream, yeah. I love it. I love that, too. We have it almost every night for dinner in our Vitamix. But sometimes we change the flavor. But there's always a banana in it for creaminess. Yeah, when you come to my house, there's always frozen banana. I cut up frozen, uh, cut up bananas, put them in a little Ziploc bag, put them in the freezer. Yeah, that's always that's- dropped. That's great. So it just uh, let, we're almost out of time, but I always ask this to almost everybody on the show, and it doesn't have to be the answer doesn't have to be in the plant based world. But who in your life has inspired you the most? Oh, I would say that's a good question. Um, probably, probably my father. Mm-hmm. He's been a, a very good inspiration to me. He's he's one of the hardest working men I I've ever seen. And he, one time he worked a full year without taking a whole day off. Oh my good. Uh, and he just is always, has always made the sacrifices for his family and his kids, uh, for us to, to get through what we need to get through. And so it's been very inspiring to me to, to see that. And I've kind of got his work ethic because of it. Wow. Sounds like kind of like Cal Ripken Jr. You know, He's the, yeah. he, he never missed a he never missed a game ever. Wow, that's that's amazing. Uh, is anybody in your family plant based, or are you kind of the lone wolf there as well? Well, I'm I'm pretty much the lone wolf right now. Um, but I will say that uh, basically all of my immediate family has uh, gotten better, and they've they've improved their diet and pretty significantly. My my dad actually improved way more than I thought he was. He loves rice and beans. So yeah. now he eats very little meat actually and he and we grew up meat and potatoes. Yeah. So he he loves rice and beans and he's growing a taste for vegetables. <laughs> so um and he likes fruit. So he's doing much better. Um my my uh little brother and uh, there's three of us, the one in the middle, he actually gave up dairy because he was lactose intolerant. He mm-hmm. was constantly popping pills for that and finally when he found out that dairy is a, a big problem with not only lactose intolerance but other 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 um, diseases and illnesses. He gave up dairy, and you know, he's not on dairy. He doesn't have any GI issues. Good so, for him. That's been positive. And then my other brother and his wife have toiled with the plant-based thing, and they've tried plant-based for a little bit, and then they kind of slipped back, and then they tried it again. So they're they're kind of back and forth, but they're really on the on the right path now. They're trying it once more. Well, I hope they read your book. Yes, I, I, everybody has my book. So, um, you know, you can, like I say, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make a drink. You just got to provide the information. And right. people and the patients have to make their own choices. So, You know, I once heard said, it might have been Dr. Campbell, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact source, but that if the plant, if they could put the, the benefits of a plant-based diet in a pill, it would be the, the, the biggest selling drug in the world ever. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. yeah, and the drug companies would be clamoring to have that pill. Yeah, and it's just it's the the solution is just so simple, so simple. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I and try to about... tell people that the, you know there's, I, I can I can give you the pills. I can tell you talk to you all about the pills, and they might help a little bit, but um, your diabetes or your heart disease it's not going to go away unless you nope. change what you eat. You know, I know like when you graduate medical school, the doctors take a Hippocratic oath. Is there a pharmacist oath by any chance? 
Um, there is, but I don't remember saying it out loud, to be honest with you. Right. Well, just, because, like the, 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 ago, just so. because from what you teach with your book, The Empty Medicine Cabinet, you know, let food be thy medicine, that could be said for, you know, what you're saying in your book. Yes, exactly. I I would love for that to be the pharmacist's oath and the medical student's oath and every healthcare practitioner's oath when they yep. graduate. Well, I'm just really honored to interview you. You're just just a, a wealth of information. Your book, The Empty Medicine Cabinet, is fantastic. And I just love that you're other than this other one pharmacist that you mentioned. You you know that you're 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 taking a stand and you're doing what you're doing. And you know who knows maybe another pharmacist will hear this or get your book and maybe there'll be more. You know. You have to lead by example in this field. You know you can't yep. not practice what you preach. And I know that you know that too. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. So just one more time, your website, people want to get in touch with you, find out, uh, read your blog or find out where you're speaking. Just one more time, the name of that website. Yes, it's uh, plantbasedpharmacist.com. What could be easier? Plant-based pharmacist. So terrific. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Dustin, for your time and for your passion for what you do. It's, I, I, I was just looking at the, I actually wrote you October of 2014. It's taken me 11 months to interview you and I'm so sorry, but it was definitely worth the wait. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And I, I love uh, all your stuff too, Chef AJ. I'm always watching your, your shows and oh, thank uh, you. post it on my Facebook because you're, right. you're an inspiration. Right. Well, you know, I have an actual TV TV show now. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Healthy Living with Chef AJ. Six episodes are out and seven more will are on the way. So perhaps you'll uh, I saw watch. that. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, if I ever, if I ever need, if I ever have to have a pharmacist on, believe me, of the two that you mentioned, you're, you're going to be the one I choose. Well, I'd love to be on. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dustin, and thank all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, y'all.